Um, so um, early proto prototypes of um, Cortex A9 processors from ARM, and then now that we're getting access to the early build out of the Calzada processor, um, we're, we're working with Calzada. We, been working with them for about 18 months across mm -hmm. FPGA. These are the very early. Um, before you actually have silicon, you can do software modeling on um, okay. what a processor will look like. So we've been working on this for a while. So you've got your own kind of little lab going, sort of virtual lab, is that right? Sort of what, what HP setting up in Houston? Have you sort of started that? or very, on, yeah. on, a, on a very small scale, but the, the great news about the Moonshot program is, f is we get access to hardware on a scale that really allows the whole ecosystem to um, start benchmarking and then optimizing. And this is the beginning of a, of a several-year journey. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, so, so talk about how you're going to use that discovery lab. I mean, is that, I mean it's, it's, it sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, they show a little video of a guy walking around. It looks like a, looks like a real yep. lab. I mean, are you guys going to go there physically, you're gonna, you know, remotely, yes, yes? So, so both. What does it mean for you guys? So as soon as we've got the, um, the initial builds up, um, we, you know, there's a lot of planning going on at the moment, but our goal is to take the daily build of Ubuntu server. So when we're in a development mode, we publish every day a build of Ubuntu server with all the applications, and we'll be testing that in these labs. And the goal is in, in the next six months, with active benchmarking, is every time we come across a problem, either in the Linux kernel, it could be in PHP, it could be in um, Apache, we identify that problem and we automatically then send that bug with a fix up to the upstream community. So this is really about accelerating the focus of upstream developers on um, you know, issues in, the, in, in these low power um, servers and also giving them access so they can actually then debug and fix ahead of this finally coming to, to market. Okay, so you'll be you'll be active Very, in that yeah. lab for the daily builds. Mm -hmm. okay. Daily builds, and we also have a, a large team in Texas, so they, uh, the most of the server team are based in Texas. Talk, can you talk about some of the dynamics around Linux and, and, and around now? I mean, obviously Linux became, you know, because of open source and commodity hardware, it was the boon for developers. Hey, sure. you know, of course it's great. Use the use the gear, make it work, stack them up. You know, rack and stack, get the processing power. Okay, now you mentioned the scale issues. Okay, mm -hmm. what are you learning in the in the program that you've been prototyping? What are some of the things you're seeing in the use cases of the that you that you can share with folks? Can you talk about that at all? Sure. So, so the first question differ from the old way, which is essentially rack and stack versus some of the new stuff. Okay, so I mean, the first question is. I think it's a change in how Linux is being used. It's always been very popular with developers. The last 10, 15 years have really seen Linux replace proprietary Unix in, in Wall Street and in big enterprise. And now we've got this new class of hyperscale customers who use Linux in a fundamentally different way at, at, a, at a much larger horizontal scale. Um, what are we doing, therefore, to, to address those, pro those, those specific issues? Well, there's some very basic making sure that, that, that all these apps and the OS work beautifully on the hardware. There's a separate set of management problems. So if you're power saving from running, I think today was 2,800 cores is what Paul announced. 2,880. 80 cores that's possible <laughs> in Iraq. You need different ma approach to management software um, so that you know, in, as you are starting to use only 50% of that power, you're literally firing off, you're turning off cores dynamically and then waking them up as necessary. And so um, a lot of the work Sure, there's a ton of work just to make sure that the stack is working beautifully on these new SOCs, but there's also a, a, a different way of thinking about the management of mo multiple nodes. And I think you'll see both open source solutions to that and some proprietary solutions um, both coming into market. I mean, people don't understand. I mean, the, how hot these processors are. I mean, you only put a you know a PC in your lap, you can feel the battery sure. cooking and the processor cooking and you know, the fans on PCs. Um, on a data center, it's massive. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of power cooling issues have you seen? Uh, the scale, have you seen any kind of numbers around how this reduces the power? So, I mean, eight, eight, I think um, Paul this morning put some high-level numbers out about what we think is achievable. I think it's too early to put... We, we want to do more benchmarking um, and before we, we, we really nail our... But it's significant. It's, oh, it's very significant. I mean, it's very significant. Because remember, it's not just power at the CPU. It's power and cooling. It's, it's waste, you know, you're dealing with the waste of... I mean, his numbers as well. are fantastic. Ten racks to a half a rack. But, I mean, you can maybe nickel dime the numbers, but you're saying it's order that, of magnitude significant. Thinking about massively parallel, using low power architectures, whether they arm or, frankly, atom, using them this different way, we think can yield enormous savings. If this was only, frankly... If we were only talking about a 10, 20% saving in power here, it wouldn't be worth the ecosystem thinking about a massive change in architecture. It's the fact that we're looking at such a huge potential saving that means that we, frankly, a developer who's responsible for Perl or PHP, we're going to... 
this is such a big saving, it's worth everyone caring. Yeah. And that's the good that's story. That's a point you just made about, about power and cooling. Because mm-hmm. for every dollar spent on, on running the IT equipment, there's another dollar spent on cooling it, on average. Yeah. Now, that's probably not the case in these large web properties. They're probably a little more efficient than that, but, 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 but still. It's, it's, it's a big issue. And I, I meet CTOs sometimes at, you know, at banks, and, we, and they'll talk about the fact that they're actively, you know, where's the new data center going and your biggest constraint is how close can I get to a piece of the grid that has the available electricity. So this is also about being much more, um, getting much more bang for buck out of existing data centers. We've been talking a lot today about sort of uh, customers innovating with IT. You remember Nick Carr's book, Does yeah. IT Matter? Mm-hmm. And of course, obviously, to guys like Google, it matters a lot. Sure. They're printing money with it. I'm envisioning a data center is an ATM. <laughs> All right. And, and, and the, the more you can get out of that ATM, the more money you're going to print. Mm-hmm. Essentially is really what we're talking about here, isn't it? I mean, these, these companies are basically profit centers. I, I, I think density of compute within an exi- existing data centers, it's, not ju- it's greenfield as well, but within existing data centers is a big part of this. The other part, and Nick Carr's book, is what's interesting is whether you look at this type of architecture of compute or whether or not you look at big data, these are solutions to problems that occurred first in hyperscale companies at Google, at Yahoo, with, with Hadoop. Mm-hmm. And, um, and what we're now seeing is people taking big data and saying, how does this apply to the traditional enterprise? And so, so I, that innovation occurred at these small number of companies is now flowing out to the mainstream. Well, the premise of the book was that, 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 that IT cannot give a sustainable competitive advantage, but data in many ways potentially changes that dramatically, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, your, your, your ability to store more of it, to, to do more um, um, analysis on it, and to do that analysis faster. Velocity, volume um, is the big driver. So it just shows that you can get incredibly wealthy from writing a book where the premise is fundamentally flawed, but, uh, but as long as you package it right. <laughs> <laughs> you can be successful. Yeah, yeah so, um, so uh, we've been talking. We're here with uh, uh, Christopher Kenyon, uh, who is with uh, Canonical, and they are behind the Ubuntu uh, Linux distribution. And um, we're here at HP Labs. Um, what's next for you guys in this space? Uh, big question. Um, we have three big focuses. Um, cloud, we've just announced actually with HP that HP's public cloud is running all on Ubuntu, um, and both as a guest and a, as a host OS. Um, so expect to see more announcements around um, OpenStack and Ubuntu That's Cloud. That's an OpenStack. Uh, that, yeah. Right. Uh, if you're building out on OpenStack, the default OS underneath that right now is Ubuntu. And um, there's a host of historical reasons for that. But expect to see lots more news around Ubuntu um, and Ubuntu Cloud and then Ubuntu and Big Data. So we're just talking about OpenStack. Because <laughs> uh, Ubu- Ubuntu is uh, you know, fundamental to OpenStack, right? Is, uh, we, we, is OpenStack ready for prime time, Christopher? Um, we know of many customers who are deploying on Diablo, and we, we certainly think that the Essex release that comes out just before our release, so that they, we, we work very closely with the OpenStack community, so as soon as their final version is out, it's ready in time to be released in the next version of Ubuntu. Um, but the Essex release is certainly, um, I think, the one that everyone's putting the big money on to be production ready. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, canonical developers who now work at, at, uh, at Rackspace and at Nebula, yeah, and, and it's a, there's a lot of uh, movement of, of, uh, of great quality talent around at the moment. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of energy behind it, that's for sure. A lot of sure. uh, Rackspace people here at HP now, from what I hear. Oh, I, I, I hear <laughs> the, the, the same thing, John Furrier and a few others. Yeah. <laughs> John Purrier, not to be confused with Furrier. Sorry, correct me. I'm John Furrier. <laughs> um, thanks for coming on the Cube. Appreciate uh, your commentary. Thank you very much for your time. Pleasure to meet you. Okay. Have a great rest of the day.